Hello, friends, and welcome back. I'm Nick, and this is MSFS Flight Plans, a place where we take simming to a whole nother level as we not only seek out and explore the most interesting, best-looking places on Earth, but we also learn a thing or two about each location after I subject myself to a one-day crash course before each flight, learning everything I can possibly stuff into my gourd before we hop in the plane. So we are still enjoying our Rocking Out series, but this one is also going to be a little deviation from really pretty much every other flight we've taken so far. We do have a collection of rocks to check out, but other than that, it is a vast landscape of flat nothingness, and I absolutely fell in love with it as soon as I got up in the air for the first time. It is so beautiful and peaceful and bucolic that I came very close to ODing on endorphins, and you might too, so be very careful. We're up in northwest Kansas, a spot you've probably flown over 100 times on your way between bigger airports. In fact, we're almost in the dead center of the United States here, so this is certainly flyover country. But I bet you've never soaked it all in from 2,000 feet above the deck. Not out here anyway, which is precisely what we're going to do. The plane I picked out for us is the Windjeel, which is so underrated in my opinion. I had been, I'd seen this thing plenty of times, but I thought, well, that's just a basic, boring-looking little plane. But one of our members said, you got to try this thing out. you got to check it out. It's a really cool plane. And I got it, and it is. It's awesome. And I'll tell you why I think it's awesome in just a minute. But I think this is going to be a home run for this kind of trip. And I know I always say that, but... I love every plane and I love every trip, so that's easy for me to say. All right, so let's get in and start her up, and then I'll give you a quick preview of our flight on the Google map, and then we'll start taxing. All right, so one of the things I love about it is it's a little bit complicated to get started, a little bit finicky to fly and even steer on the ground. So there's two different models that you get with it. One's modern, and I think the only difference with the modern one is modern radio, so I'm not even going to fool with that because I don't even really know how it works, but that is a radio. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is get this ground slash flight switch switched over, and I think that turns the battery on since everything just lit up. And then we move the throttle up just a little bit. It says give it about an inch. And then we take the mix all the way off. That's fine. And propeller to full. And this does have an auto lean and an auto rich and then a full rich. But we're just going to move it to auto rich and let it ride from there. Okay, that's done. And then generator field on, which is probably the alternator. And then the boost pump on, which I need to remember to turn off and I never do. And then we prime this thing on a cold start six times. One, two, three, four, five. Six. It says six to eight, but we'll just do six. That should work for us just fine. And then these ignition switches on. And then, okay, so we're going to turn the starter on. And then once it turns over about four or five times, then we switch the mixture to auto rich. I'm looking at my checklist here. All right, so I'm going to have to lean down here to see this. The starter's under there, so we'll go ahead and start it up. And then we'll give it some mixture. And it does have a positive stop on this. I'm just moving my throttle quadrant, but it'll stop in the right spot without you having to try to eyeball it. Okay, so then we need to bring our RPMs up to around 1100, and that will get this generator fail light to go off. So we'll slowly let it creep up there. And look at that RPM thing. It's got like a second hand and an hour hand, so it goes all the way around one time for 1000, then it goes all the way around again for 2000. All right, so we'll let that run up, and we can turn the boost off for now. Remember to do it this time. And then our gyro and instruments on. And with this thing, you have to reset these. So you can see our artificial horizon here is cockeyed. That's not right. So you just click that once, resets it. And if you wanted to use your accelerometer, you click on that. And that'll reset that. So I don't think we're going to be pulling hard enough Gs to use that. But now we know it's good to go. Okay. And then just check our barrel. So that's good. Everything's good. Okay. Let's go ahead and shut our canopy here. And this little lock is a two-position lock. I'm not sure what the first one does, but... You gotta hit it twice, and then you can still open the window if you want. So we'll lock that too. Locked. Okay, let's look at the Google map real quick. So you can see where the heck we are. That's it. <laughs> let, me, let me zoom out a little bit. As I said, we're in the middle of nowhere. Okay, so here's the United States, and then here's Kansas right smack in the middle of it. And I'm gonna mention this a little bit later. Uh, a lot of these formations we're looking at were created because this whole area, this lower elevation area here, used to be a huge inland sea that I had mentioned on one of our other flights. But it really cut the country in half. It went all the way up here, all the way up through here, and sliced the country completely in half. So at one time, hundreds of millions of years ago, you could take a ship right through the middle of the, the country if you wanted to, assuming you had a time machine. Okay, so let's zoom in here. All right, there's Dodge City, which might be the closest big city to where we are. We're leaving from Scott City. And the airport is right. Oh, there it is right there. So there's the airport right there. So we're going to come down this way because I want to circle out here. So Scott Seed will be on the left side of the plane. It's just going to be tiny. We'll just do a quick fly by that. This whole trip is about 33 miles, by the way. So it'll be pretty quick. And then we're going to come up here, check out one of the only bodies of water in the area. And then our rocks are going to be somewhere out here. And then we're going to land somewhere over here. So that's the route that we're taking. All right, I could not figure out. There is a tablet you can turn on and you can fiddle with all the different eye candy and stuff like that if you want to. Chalks and all that. 
change your co-pilot if you want. It was Chet's wife, so I turned her off. I can't stand to look at her even for 20 minutes. I could not figure out how to get this little GPS map on, which will be very handy since we do not have an autopilot in this thing. But there's a tiny little click spot right up there. So if you got this plane, you're trying to figure that out, or you get it, you're going to be frustrated like me. All right, there's our map. Okay, let's go ahead and taxi. This parking is all the way at the other end of the runway, so we have to taxi just a little bit. But that's fine because I got a few things I want to tell you about. Let me get little nav map set up. Nav map set up. Mav nap. Thinking about napping already. Man, I hope you guys like this as much as I did. It was just like, wow, this is amazing. Okay, let's start taxiing. This thing's ground handling is not good. Very, very hard to take tight turns in this parking brake off. I've got full left pedal right now, so I'm going to actually have to use the brake a little bit just to make this turn. And then we get to the end of the runway, I'm just going to have to stomp on that left brake or it will not make the turn. All right, we'll kind of cut between that light right there. This is the live weather. Beautiful day out here. And we got about a four knot wind directly from the west, 268 degrees. It'll probably pick up to 15 or 20 knots once we're in the air. All right, I might have to break again just to take a right here on the runway. Let's see if we can do it. Maybe we get just a little bit of rudder authority once we get some wind going on that thing. Look how wide that turn is. That's full right pedal right there. Not complaining though. Love this plane. It's such a fun plane. Okay. So this airport is Scott City Municipal with its 5,000 foot runway. And there's a little grass one. I don't know if you could see it from that Google map that crosses right around the middle of it. It's about half that size. And I really couldn't find much information about this place other than that it is not used for commercial traffic. I don't know where the nearest commercial airport is. But the town of Scott City, you probably saw is directly west of here, so we'll take a quick peek at that once we get headed in that direction. But since it's so tiny, with a population of around 4,000, we'll only see it for a second. So I'll tell you a little bit about how it popped up out here, in the middle of nowhere in the Great Plains. In October of 1884, two ladies decided they'd had enough of big city life out in Chicago. So they decided to move out here and build themselves a cabin which was pretty bold because this was all Indian country back then. And four months later, figuring their odds of getting a date might be better out here than in Chicago, two men also moved from the city and moved into the cabin with those ladies. And I couldn't tell if they knew them before or just wanted to take their chances. And a year later, one of the two original women figured that any proper town with a population of four should definitely have a newspaper. So she started publishing the Western Times. And apparently it was a pretty compelling read because according to Wikipedia, and this is a quote, after that, the county started to fill rapidly. <laughs> so I don't know what she was writing in that thing. Maybe she had some tasteful nudes in there or something. All right, so when we get down to the end here, I'm just going to have to left pedal stomp and pretty much floor it to get this thing turned around, which is fine. You got to do what you got to do. And that's about all I could learn about old Scott City. But judging by what we're about to see, I'm going to guess that their primary economic driver out here is agriculture. Not much else around here. And if it's like all the other small towns we've seen, I bet the biggest employers are probably in the town. Healthcare and education. That's usually how it goes with these tiny little towns. Come on, keep going. Keep going. Good grief. All right, we'll do a few final checks, and then we'll be on our way. So our cruising altitude will probably be, you can see we're at about 3,000 feet right now. Let's see if I can not nosedive here. I almost did, didn't I? Uh, we're probably going to get to between five and 6,000, and we need about 4,000 to come in because our runway altitude is going to be 2,600 feet. Okay, so landing lights on, one notch of flaps. Check our barrel one more time. And we'll turn the boost back on while we're taking off. Oh man, that's what happens. I turn the throttle down too much. You cannot do that. All right, let's start it back up again. There we go. Once it's warmed up, it starts pretty easy. Okay. If you guys are ready, let's go ahead and do it. On our way. A little bit hard to handle on the ground, so what you're supposed to do is give it full back stick till you're at about 40 knots. And that's supposed to lock the tail wheel, so I got full back stick now. And then just bring that nose down. So let it come down some. Oh, it's still. No, nope. keep the tail wheel locked then. There we go. It's still a little squirrely. It's a tiny little plane, as you probably saw. And you can pretty much keep the throttle wide open at this altitude. We're going to have to pull it back a little bit, but our cruising RPMs are 2200. So we'll pull those back some. All right, flaps up. And because I'm going to forget, I'm going to turn the boost pump off and the landing lights off. 
All right, so RPM's back. 2200. And manifold pressure to about 28. We're good. And I'm just going to keep glancing at our little GPS map there. All right. So the reason why we're out here is because one of our longtime members, and only the second female simmer that I'm aware of, just took a trip out here in real life. And she said there is a big rock formation that's also a POI in the sim, and if she hadn't told me that, I would never know it, because who the heck is looking around on the ground out here in western Kansas? So after I got over my initial shock that there were rocks in Kansas, I thought it was nothing but wheat and tornadoes. I cruised out here to see what else I didn't know about, and was just blown away by this landscape. So there's uh, Scott City right there, and that's named after U.S. General Winfield Scott. Old fuss and feathers himself. Who got that moniker because he was really big on military decorum. And you should check out a picture of that guy. You'll know exactly why they call him old fuss and feathers. Looks a little bit stuffy. But that's it. That's the whole town. And we are about 100 miles away from any other major population centers. At least 100 miles away. But you can see there's lots of farming going on out here. Alright, so I'm going to trim up just a little bit because we want to keep climbing some. And man, we don't have much airspeed. We usually should be cruising at level flight. We should be at around 120 knots, so we'll give it a little bit more manifold pressure. But this whole corner of the state is covered with, once we get away from the farmland here and head north, covered with little river channels and ravines, which I was shocked to find in Kansas. And despite not being able to see them very well in the sim, there is a whole lot more interesting rock formations beside the one that we're going to head out to. It's a geologist wonderland and paleontologist. Apparently this is a gold mine of fossils as well. I'll tell you more about that in just a little bit. Alright, so we'll take our northern turn here. And we're going to take a slight detour to the west. I mean, we've got to head up north anyway, but there's a big cattle farm I spotted out here. And on the Google map, there were so many cows jammed into it that I wanted to see if we could actually see them in the sim. So since we're heading that direction, I figured we'd peel off to the left a little bit here. See if we can spot them. Looked like someone kicked over an anthill or something. There were so many of those things. And it said the ranch is owned by Cutler Cattle, and I don't know much beyond that. But it's right at the threshold of where all of the little ravines and channels start, so after we see that, we'll get up into the cool-looking terrain. But man, talk about a chill ride. Look at this. Wait till you see all these little landscape features they got up here. Alright, so this is going to be the ranch right up here. We'll take a close flyby and see if we can see all those cows. I bet we can. I mean, there were so many of those things in there. They may not be real detailed, but I bet we'll see them. And there's another one off here to the left but they didn't have nearly as many cows. And right behind that's the first big ravine, and I really wanted to try to figure out when all this stuff was carved out, because it doesn't look super ancient. But then I noticed that there's little houses and ranches built right down into the bottoms of a lot of these things. And I can't imagine anyone would be doing that if they had flooding issues out here. So I'm going to assume they've been dry for a pretty long time. Alright, so there, all of these brown spots here, including that center one, have the cattle in them. And those dark spots are probably the cows, because that's what it would look like. Alright, we're at 6,000 now, and I don't need to go any higher than that, so... We'll trim down a little bit. And we got our airspeed where we want it. So we'll back that manifold pressure off a little bit. We got an 8 knot crosswind now. Yep, that's where all the cows would be, all those brown spots. Gathering up around the feeding trough, probably. You can kind of see them, look at that. You got a big screen. Very cool. Who doesn't want to see a bunch of cows? All right, so here's where all these ravines start, and they're just all over the place up here. And we've got a couple spots to check out, and I need to make sure we navigate to a good angle to see them, so I'm going to try to keep an eye on that GPS map. The first is a place called Griffith Ranch, also in the middle of one of these ravines. A little bit of gusting there. And they have a big field wheat, I'm imagining, with pictures that are mowed into the wheat. And it looks like they change it up pretty frequently. On the Google map, there was a big maze with a cross and a Bible verse carved into it. John 3.16, of course. And then in the little nav map, map, there is a giant longhorn steer carved into it with a maze around it. And I can't really tell what the thing is out here, so we'll see if we can get a little bit closer and take a look at it and figure out what the heck that is. And then just north of that, we're going to see a little lake just east of an area called Battle Canyon. And in that canyon, on September 27th of 1878, the Battle of Punished Woman's Fork occurred. And I don't think that's the utensil kind of fork, I think it's the land feature. 
pitting the U.S. Army against a band of roughly 90 Comanche warriors that were fleeing a reservation in Oklahoma with around 250 women, children, and elderly trying to make it up to Montana where there was some free Comanche up there. And when the Army finally tracked them up here, the Comanche lured them into this ravine in hopes of ambushing them from the high ground. But they blew their cover when one of their guys shot prematurely. So the Army scurried up the side and tried to take them out, but only got one of them. But the Comanche killed only one of theirs, but it was their leader. <laughs> so I guess that was a relatively fair swap. All right, so I got to get a good angle here. We're not quite there yet. I thought that might be it down there. It's going to be up here just a little bit further. But by dumb luck, the soldiers, the U.S. soldiers, managed to stumble across the hiding spot for all the Comanche horses, which they either killed or captured, which compelled the Indians to raid several more towns to the north, an escapade that involved quite a bit of killing, pillaging, and raping. But they captured about half of those guys, the Indians, and brought one of them to one of the groups that they captured down one of the local forts around here. All right, so let's take a little flight over here. So here's Punished Woman's Fork. And then here's this field. And I cannot tell what that is. I mean, the steer was really obvious. It was huge. Its horns went from side to side. And then here's where that battle took place. That was the last battle in Kansas between the U.S. government and the Indians. Looks like they got a maze or something carved in there, but I don't know what that is in the middle. All right, let's come back over this way. We got a little bit too far, of course. But that's perfectly fine. All right, so this body of water up here, one of the very few in the area, is Lake Scott. And it's surrounded by a big public park with campgrounds and fishing areas and all that jazz. And we're going to see if we can spot something called El Cartalejo, which is the ruins of a seven-room pueblo built by a small band of Plains Indians who were fleeing the Spanish in the 1600s. And that's going to be right here. They've also got a really old prairie house down here somewhere, but you can't see it. It's in the trees. I'm going to see if we can see the ruins of this Pueblo. And it's just the foundation. It might be a little bit too high. Oh gosh, yeah, we're at, oh, we're at 5,500 feet. Let's see if we can see it. A little square thing's it right there. We can definitely see the outline of it, can't you? In some of the rooms. But I couldn't figure out if they were running from the Spanish and hiding out here, or if the Spanish caught them and put them out here. Because it wasn't really clear about that. But either way, what a great little spot to live. You got one of the only watery spots in the area. Obviously, there's no problem growing anything out here. And I'm sure there's all kinds of wildlife. Look at this landscape. If you're not from Kansas, did you have any idea that there was land like this in Kansas? I was shocked and delighted. Just looks beautiful. And just so little population. But obviously, human habitation. See all these things here? We're going to see quite a few of those. Those are watering holes. And if you get right over it, right in the middle, you'll see where the little water tank is. And all these little lines coming out for it are probably horse and cattle tracks. But they got them all over the place out here. All right, let's come this way. we got to go over to our rocks. Which are about 10 miles out at this point. And we'll take a look at this side of the plane, too. Look at this stuff. Just amazing. So beautiful. It kind of reminds me of that area west of San Antonio, which we did not get to see on that flight. Because we were heading east from there. But once you get out of the hill country, it's a little bit more choppy than this but it's kind of like this and probably a little drier too I don't think there's a lot of farms out there so just to give you a heads up these are not going to be Jeppesen quality rocks those guys are the masters of rock formations in the sim but it does stick out enough to let you know that there's something down here and the place is officially called monument rocks and they got some buttes which are those things that stick up all by themselves and arches which I probably don't need to explain but they aren't as massive as some of those really big ones out west, with the tallest of these going up about 70 feet. And these are chalk deposits. They were originally formed by sediment at the bottom of that massive inland sea. And that was during the Cretaceous period, about 100 million years ago. But they said there were several different periods of water coverage out here, so I don't know if that was the most recent or what. And I don't know when all these things dried up, but you can see they're pretty dry now. But look incredible. So good. Man, that's incredible. And the reason there's so many fossils out here, which I mentioned before, is precisely because this whole area used to be a seabed. So as stuff died, it just quickly buried itself with mud and silt. Well, I doubt it buried itself. But that's the perfect cocktail for fossil formation. 
All right, I'm going to cut the throttle a little bit because I want to descend some to get a little bit closer to these rocks. And with all these little canyons carving up the landscape, I bet you don't have to dig for anything out here. You can just probably walk along the sides of these and pluck stuff right out of the ground. I actually found a cool site that talks about fossil hunting in Kansas that I'll link in the video description if you guys want to check it out. If you're as much of a paleo geek like me, you want to learn more about it. But that site said they found all kinds of shark's teeth, some massive prehistoric fish skulls and skeletons. And of course more trilobites that you can shake a stick at. But they said if you go to any major museum anywhere in the world and they have Cretaceous sea life, they said there's a pretty good chance they pulled it out of western Kansas. Which I thought was cool. Two of the finds that I thought were particularly cool from this area was a 14-foot-long fish that they think died by choking on a 6-foot-long fish, which was fossilized in its stomach. <laughs> Which is neat. And they also found a giant sea turtle with hundreds of shark teeth marks all over its shell, which they believe is probably how that guy met his demise. All right, so pretty soon we'll see these things sticking up. Okay, that's them right in front of us. So we're going to come way down and see how closer we can get to those things. And remember this. Oh, now it's behind our pillar. Let me see if I can get it in view. This spot right here. I'm going to tell you what's down there. We can't see it in the sim, but there's an interesting little story behind that, which I'll tell you about in just a second. Let's cruise by these rocks. All right, so we'll start overspeeding at 140 knots, so we'll take a little dive here. We got some bandwidth. Not much, though. And speaking of shark's teeth, around here in Jacksonville, well, just north of Jacksonville, really, in the shallow rivers that run out to the Atlantic in southern Georgia, people find lots of megalodon teeth, which are those huge, huge ones. And I was up in Amelia Island this weekend, which is just north of Jacksonville, visiting my parents who live up there. And I walked into a little trinket shop, and they had two big glass cases full of those things, which I'm sure they were probably buying from local divers. And so I was checking out the prices. I mean, I'm talking hundreds of them. I've never seen so many in one spot. And for one that's completely broken in half and all beat up and stuff, that was probably 300 bucks. I don't know what they pay the divers for them, but that was what the price tag said. But for one that was big and in good shape, three or 4,000 bucks. Look at that. Who would have thought you'd find something like that in Kansas? And again, there's spots that not quite as big as these, but there's stuff like that all over the place out here. You can look around online and see pictures of it. Very, very cool. And one of our members was just out there. Amazing. All right, that little spot I was showing you before is a spot where there's a trail marker for something that was called the Butterfield Overland Trail which was a stagecoach route that they had out here in, well, they opened it in 1858, but they built it from the Missouri River way out east, out to Denver was the terminal point of it. And then I guess you could come back from Denver. After they found some gold out by Denver and all the prospectors and everyone wanted to head out there. So I think they probably intentionally made them ride by the rocks to give people yet another reason to hop on the stagecoach, which apparently was not a real pleasant journey. Not only was it probably very bumpy, but the Indians out here were a big problem so they built a fort just to the west of where that monument is, which unfortunately is not there anymore, just to try to help people out with the Indian issue. And there were a lot of tribes that were passing through here. Obviously the Pueblos who built that little spot we just saw, and the Comanches, I told you about that. At the Battle of Angry Woman's Fork. What a great name. <laughs> Another great name is the uh, when the tribe split in two after the soldiers took all their horses and after they were done raping and pillaging and all that. The guy that made it to Montana's name was Little Wolf. The guy that got captured, his name was Dull Knife, <laughs> which is just great. All right, we need to pick it up a little bit. I want to be a little faster than 100 knots. So the place we're coming into is called the Lundgren Hereford Ranch, Niner Kilo Sierra 6. And they got a little grass strip out here that's about 2,500 feet long. And there are no add-ons available for this flight. I thought there might be two of them because when I was using that flightsim.to map, there was a two with a circle in it right over this area. And when I zoomed in, they were just generic entire country of the U.S. add-ons. So I guess just because it's right in the middle of the U.S., that's where they put the mark for it. Fortunately, this grass strip is pretty easy to spot compared to some of the others in the sim. Last time I was out here, there was a big cloud covering it, so that made it harder. But it looks like we don't have any cloud shadows out here now, so that'll be good. And we need to get down to about 4,000 feet, which is where we're at now, which is great. Okay, so a couple quick announcements as we usually do this part of the flight. The voting for our quarterly flight plan recommendation competition is open, and that is on our YouTube page. Just click on the community tab. It is the post at the top. You can vote there, and I've linked those three videos if you want to check them out. Those are all member recommendations. And right now, the Australian flight is just barely eking out 
barely eking out by like three percentage points the Whistler Mountain Flight. So we'll probably leave that open for another week and then close her down. And if you want to recommend a flight, join our Discord server. The link for that will also be in the video description where we do all kinds of awesome stuff like talk about awesome aviation things and do some group flights and stuff like that. Whenever I'm doing my test flights, I always go in there and turn on the group chat feature so anyone who wants to join can, but you need to get into Discord. And if you're afraid of Discord like I was, I'm an old fuddy-duddy. I'm 48 years old. That stuff's too newfangled for me. It is ridiculously easy to use. So just click on that, hop in there. It's just like using a chat room. Very, very easy, so don't fear it if you're not familiar with how that works. And as far as upcoming flights, I think I'm going to skip the Mount Rushmore flight. I know I've been talking about it, but it really doesn't look that good. The mount itself doesn't look very good, and the landscape around it's really bad, so I'm sure if you wanted to see it bad enough, you've probably already been out there. It's kind of a long flight, so we'll skip that, do the Sri Lanka flight, and probably wrap up our rocking out tour. And I've had a few requests. I'm going to ask you guys' opinion about this, because you know I've always said we don't do tutorials here, but I have posted a few tutorials, always germane to what we're doing here on the channel. You know, I don't do startup procedures and things like that for any of these planes. There's plenty of that stuff out there. But... Occasionally, we do do things like radio nav flights, ILS landings. You know, we use all the GA-style avionics. If you'd like to see some tutorials about that, or if there's something specific you want to see, let me know. Because it doesn't take any prep time to make one of those. And I thought it might be really fun to try a flight using nothing but a compass and stopwatch. I haven't done that in a while, and that's a lot of fun. So if you want to see how to do that, we could check something like that out. All right, we're back up to almost 5,000 feet again, so I need to concentrate on getting down to this field, and more importantly, finding it. Once we get on the runway heading, I recall it not being too tough to see, but we're way high, so we'll come on down. Oh, it's a little breezy up here now, so we got a 10-knot tailwind now. Where is this place? Anybody see it? Well, we'll see it once we get on our heading here. All right, so at that next magenta line, we should be three miles out. Man, I feel like it was just sticking out like a sore thumb before. We'll find it. Don't worry. So let me know. If there's a tutorial of some kind you want to see, just go ahead and float it up there. I'll throw one of those up there if you guys really want to see stuff like that. And, of course, we'll just keep our usual flight schedule. I'm going to go ahead and give it one notch of flaps. And then just hope we can find this thing. <laughs> Where is it? I'm just veering back and forth looking for it. Oh, there it is. There it is. Okay, I found it. Good grief. This thing has four notches of flaps, but it said the fourth setting is just for emergencies. And hopefully we won't have an emergency, so I'm just going to use the three settings. And our across the threshold speed is about 70 knots. So we'll try to get down there. And for a tail dragger, this baby lands pretty easily. Sometimes I'll get a hop or two, but most of the time it is significantly easier than most of the other tail draggers. And then once we're done, we'll check out a little nav map. I'll give you a little bit closer view of some of that stuff. And I want to show you that huge field carving of that steer. That was incredible. Might have been aliens that did it. And we'll take a better look at that Pueblo, too. And we flew right over a spot that was called right by, uh, let's see, what was that near? It was by the Angry Woman's Fork. That was just called the White Woman's Tomb. And I could not find any information about it. And you know I tried with a name like that. I found a couple other places that are called that, but it wasn't that one. So I'm sure there's a story behind that. If you've ever been out through here and know anything about that, let me know, because my curiosity has certainly peaked. All right, let's try to hit 70 knots. I'm going to trim up a little bit here. I'm not even going to turn our landing lights on because that would be too much of a distraction, and I don't think we have to worry about any traffic around here. I'm not even going to drive anywhere to park. We'll just stop it, shut it down, and check out a little nav map. What a cool, cool flight. Thank you so much for this recommendation. I never would have thought to come out here. Just beautiful. And there's the, you're about to stall sound. Right on time. Are we gonna run out of runway? Nope. All right, full back pressure on the stick. Brakes. Lots of brakes. Try not to nosedive. All right. Flaps up, parking brake on, 
And you know what? I didn't write down the shutdown procedure for this one either, but I bet we can figure it out. I know if I just cut the throttle, it usually shuts off, but we'll cut the mixture. And then cut these guys, and we'll go back to the ground setting. Okay. And, of course, we got to open the canopy. Probably feels so good out here. Well, I can't see the thing now. There we go. There we go. All right, we'll just crack it a little bit. Okay, so let's just take a quick peek at this. Almost short enough for a lunch break flight, but not, not quite. We didn't quite make it. All right, so, and look at this out here. So you can see how many of those ravines I have all up here. So here's the border with Kansas up here. This whole area up here, you can see where they are. But then all the rest of it, just flat wheat fields everywhere. All right, so here's Scott City and all of its glory. We took off this way, came over here, and the first spot we want to check out is the cattle ranch. Look at those things. I think that's what those dark spots were. I mean, that's what it would have been. And I wonder how close you can get and how much detail you can see. I mean, it's not going to be much better than that because that's a full zoom right there. But that's pretty cool. All right, and here is the field art. Check this thing out. Look at that. Impressive, huh? Man. So, I mean, if you think about the size of a tractor, look at those cars. Like, how in the world do you do that? Probably the same way you make crop circles, if you're actually making them and it's not aliens. All right, here's where the Battle of Punished Woman's Fork was. And here's Battle Canyon. So I guess it was probably up on this side. All the Indians came up here and were hiding out. Someone jumped the gun a little bit, literally. And all the soldiers came up here, chased them away, got one of their own guys killed, and then found their horses hiding somewhere. And there's one of those watering holes. I bet they got a fancy word for those out here. Probably a Kansas belly button. That's what I'd call it. All right, and there's the white woman's grave. And they got a little tombstone. One tombstone right there. You can see a little bit better on the Google map. Don't know the story behind that, but boy, would I like to. Okay, and up here is the Scott County State Fishing Lake. And they got some trees and everything down there. That looks beautiful. So there's where the Steel Home Museum is, a little prairie house, which is buried in the trees. You can't see that. But here's where that little uh, Pueblo adobe is. And it looked just like that in the sim. You could really see it just like that. So that's where it was. Boy, what a great spot to live if you're going to move out here, huh? You got your own little peninsula here. You got water. You can fish there, grow stuff everywhere. Just great. That's where I'd want to live if I was out here 300 years ago. All right, so we came up this way, and then here's our rocks out here. Look at all this stuff. So incredible. I mean, just fly around anywhere out here. Never mind looking for rocks. It is just so, If you just need to chill for a little while, just take a flight anywhere up here in northwest Kansas. All right, let's let that depixelate, and then we'll see our rocks real quick. There they are. There's the rocks. And then here is where the little stagecoach marker is. You know what? That was in the Google map, not here, but it's right here. That's where it was. And it's just a little pillar sticking up in the ground. They probably have those all over the place out here, too. And then we came on in for our approach, and that was it. And that runway was a lot harder to find than it was the last time. I had to come in from the south on one of our previous flights. Just don't even bother doing it. Change the wind if you have to, because they have got a bunch of, in these fields right here, a bunch of default buildings that they slapped in the middle of these fields, and it was so disappointing. Ruined the whole experience for me, so do not come in from the south. Or you're going to see those things, and it'll just make your eyeballs bleed. Be terrible. Okay, so up next, we're going to have that Sri Lanka flight. Then we'll wrap up the Rocking Out Tour, and then we'll be back on to member recommendations and a few spots I've been wanting to check out. And I'm sure it's going to be an absolute blast, as always. Cannot wait to see you all again in the skies. Later.